Well, a great time of worship uh, so far together, and I am excited to share the Word of God with you this morning. Um, you know, every so often you come across a, a passage in the Scripture, and you um, are comforted uh, by it. Um, so let me front load the things I'm going to talk about today by saying, this is one of these passages that I, I guarantee you, um, you and I are not perfectly carrying out. Uh, we will absolutely be challenged by what we see from this passage today. Um, we have a long way to go. It's one of those passages we're going to look at and you'll say, that's impossible. Well, uh, we're going to do our very best to try to understand what the text is saying and then apply its relevance to our lives. So uh, please join me in a word of prayer and then we'll dedicate our time uh, to, to the Lord. Father, we thank you once again as we come before your presence as we have sung and praised you and have worshipped you, we have acknowledged your greatness, your rich favor and kindness in our lives. Lord, we know that um, living a life that is pleasing to you is not possible in and of ourselves. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so the only way that we can put into practice your book is with your supernatural divine help. So we dedicate uh, this time into your care. Uh, we pray that uh, we will be struck with your word and its relevance to our lives and that you will help us to be able to impl implement its truths. And we'll be careful to give you the praise in the glorious name of your son. Amen. Well, for this morning's message, I toyed with the idea of different sermon titles that I might use. Uh, but then I thought you probably would not take me seriously if I spoke on aping the Almighty. And so I landed with copying the Creator. As you and I know, obviously, it's, it's flattering, but it's beyond flattering. It's an honor when there's someone who wants to come along and, and copy our lives, especially uh, the virtuous qualities of our lives, those positive qualities that uh, don't embarrass us. And when I was in the sixth grade, our entire class, all of the students, were required to write on the person I most admire. As you think back when you were a sixth grader, who comes to your mind in terms of who you most admired uh, back then? Well, based on that assignment, I decided I'm going to write all about Jerry West, who at the time was a superstar with the Los Angeles Lakers. And as a big time fan of Jerry West, I listened to all of the um, the, the games on the radio, I watched every telecast on, on TV. As a huge fan, I, I fervently rooted for Jerry West uh, with all of my heart, all of the passion uh, that a young kid could muster. In fact, I was such a huge fan of Jerry West that I went ahead and I, I hung his poster on one of the walls in my bedroom. And I did my very best whenever I was able to get outside and, and practice. I, I tried to, to replicate uh, his jump shot. Well, as it turned out, I was selected to be one of the few students who was asked to give a speech based on what we wrote as kids on this subject, the person I most admire. The speech was to be delivered uh, at my elementary school culmination. And of course, my parents, uh, they showed up for uh, the ceremony. And my mom told me afterward that my dad was absolutely crushed as he was listening to me talk. You see, he really thought that I most admired him. Many zealous fans go beyond just holding their favorite athlete or entertainer in high esteem. They, as fans, become obsessed to the point where uh, they want to 
perfectly copy that person who they so greatly admire. The problem is they go too far. They take things just too far and they wind up getting involved in hero worship. Now, God understands our desire to emulate someone who we admire, someone who we greatly appreciate, someone who we think is further along than where we are, but his desire is that we emulate him. Is that your desire this morning? Is it your, your passionate, zealous commitment to be an individual um, who is, is so interested in, in striving to be like the Lord? Is that, is that really a, a priority for you? It, it isn't for a lot of folks, but it, it needs to be. We need to recognize how extremely important it is that we are patterning our lives after the Lord himself. You see, people are frail, sinful um, individuals who, who err all the time. And if we get real close to certain individuals and, and we're watching their life up close and personal, we will be disappointed eventually. And so it behooves us to pattern ourselves after the Lord himself. In fact, that's a common theme that we discover throughout the New Testament. Jesus repeatedly calls us uh, to, to copy him, to follow him and his lifestyle. Not just a mere man, but the Lord himself. On one occasion, Jesus is talking with a couple of his disciples, and he says to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. In the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to this vast audience of individuals. And he tells them something that is very important for them to understand. He says, therefore, you are to be perfect. Wow, that's quite a challenge. You are to be perfect. How so? As your heavenly Father is perfect, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Now, those who were closest to Jesus during his earthly ministry emphasized the importance of following after Christ and conforming to his lifestyle. For example, the Apostle Peter drives home this point. He stresses how critically important it is to be like Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, he says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So Jesus didn't just come here to teach. He didn't just come here to die on the cross and rise from the dead. He came here to be an example, uh, to be our paradigm for us to follow. The Apostle John, who was also part of Jesus' inner circle, saw his life up close and personal. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 echoes this same thought of how important it is to follow after the example of Jesus. There in 1 John 2, verse 6, he says, The one who abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So Peter, John, who were close, they were tight with Jesus, saw this extreme important understanding of walking, following, patterning themselves after Christ. Now as we come to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle Paul is basically saying the same thing. He is saying, you need to have your character match the character of the Lord himself. Basically, what, what Paul tells us in the passage that we're going to be studying together is that you need to be a clone of Christ. You need to mimic, you need to model the Messiah. So let me ask you this. Is it your strong desire today uh, to emulate the life and the character, the words and the actions of the Lord himself? 
If you can say yes to that question, then I would love for you to eyeball for yourself the first two verses of the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, starting off in verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now, I'd like you to start off here noticing with me the very first word. It is the word, therefore. And a good question to ask yourself, especially when there is a chapter break in the Bible, is, is to ask yourself, why is the therefore there? For what reason? Well, that word, therefore, is there as a result of the immediately preceding context. As a result, Paul says, of you being fully forgiven, of you being freely forgiven, this is what you need to understand. This is what you need to apply. And it's this. Copying our creator should be the daily pursuit of every believer. Hear that again. Let it process within you. Let it soak in. Copying our creator should be a daily pursuit of every believer. In other words, high on our priority list needs to be this fervent, passionate desire to be more godly, to model godliness, to be Christ-like, to model that. Now, with that said, there are a couple of important observations I'd like to bring to your attention today. And there are two points that I'd love for you to grasp with me this morning. Uh, these points are so serious that if we really take them to heart, then I'm convinced Shepherd of the Hills Church will become a phenomenal, impactful uh, community of believers in Tehachapi and beyond. If we take these two points seriously that we're going to be discovering together, then we cannot help but have marriages that grow, that have families that are strengthened, and God will be glorified. Now in this passage, we discover that these two points come down to this. There is a dictate for copying the creator, and there is a design for copying the creator. So let's go ahead and dive into that first uh, point together, and that would be the dictate for copying the creator. Now, by that, I mean that um, there is a, a certain order. There is an instruction. We are told to do this. This is not an option for us. The importance of following our creator and modeling him uh, can be illustrated not only by good positive examples that we have in our lives, but also by bad examples, believe it or not. Do you remember uh, ever hearing about uh, a chap by the name of Mark Twain? Yeah, he was an author, prolific author in the day. And Mark Twain, um, during his, his time on the planet, uh, he was exposed to uh, various church leaders who were absolute hypocrites. He was around individuals who dragged the name of Jesus through the mud, and on account of their bad example, uh, Mark Twain became very adverse to the Bible and to the Christian faith. For example, uh, at different times, Mark Twain um, would hear from different preachers, and they actu actually used the scripture, they used God's word to justify slavery. That's what they taught back in the day. Can you imagine BLM existing at that time where there are people in churches that are saying, hey, slavery is all good. In fact, it's right out of the scriptures. Let's go for it. How would Black Lives Matter, that movement, uh, fare in keeping with that? Oh, that would be fireworks, wouldn't it? Beyond that, Mark Twain, he knew of some elders and some deacons, not only who had their own slaves, but they abused their slaves. And then, of course, there were uh, people who attended church 
completely hypocritical. They were using foul language during the course of the week, and they were utterly dishonest with their practices uh, through the week. But they knew how to put on the the Christian look on Sunday. Uh, They um, became religious. They were involved in religiosity uh, when it came to, to Sundays. And as a result of these horrible examples, Mark Twain, as a result of that, He wanted to have absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. Because of those poor examples, the bad teaching, he absolutely wanted absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. He became bitter toward the things of God. I tell you, we do great damage as believers um, when we don't talk the talk and have it match the walk when what we are professing is not being lived out in our lives, when hypocrisy is ruling the day. And so this is a reminder to us to follow God's dictate to copy him, to emulate him. I don't know about you, but um, I find impersonators really interesting uh, to watch and to listen to and uh, my, my kids every so often said, have you ever seen this guy named Frank Caliendo? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not too sure who that is. Anyway, they, they bring him up on YouTube, and this guy's hysterical. He's really good at impersonations. Maybe for those of you who aren't acquainted with uh, Frank Caliendo, uh, who comes to your mind is Rich Little. Uh, he um, is a tremendous impersonator. And these guys have as their goal, as they are impersonating famous personalities, um, is, is to mimic to a T who it is they're trying to impersonate. And we need to be impersonators of the Lord, not in a pretentious, phony way, uh, but we need to have our conduct match our words, to live in such a way that we are accurate replicas of God before the world around us. I love how the first part of Ephesians 5 verse 1 shares this, and I'll call it, staggering thought. It says, be imitators. Moffat in his translation says, copy God. The Living Bible, a paraphrase, says, follow God's example in everything you do. The New English Bible says, try to be like him. Now, I'd like for you to notice that this dictate that God gives to us can be carried out through our ability. We are told to do something. This is not God doing something on our behalf. This is something where we are told, this is your part. This is your part to play. And so in the text here, once again, Paul says, you be imitators. All of us are familiar with a, um, a bright, colorful bird known as a parrot. And what is unique about parrots, besides the fact that they are exquisite to look at, uh, they're easy on the eyes? Well, parrots have this unique ability uh, to be able to communicate or say the words that are, are taught to them, words that they hear oftentimes. We make reference to how... Uh, so-and-so is just parroting someone else. Uh, they, they heard something that was spoken by another individual, so they're, they're parroting uh, that individual. Uh, now, we also know that kids are, are famous or infamous, depending on how you want to look at it, as being natural parents. They're continually parroting their parents. They're imitating their parents. Uh, people have often told me and have told Zanita that our son David is, is like a, a little Jeff. And um, how I communicate myself is, is how David communicates. And it's kind of uh, scary because it's like looking at a mere reflection. Of course, David's goal today is not to be a, a mini-me, not to be a, a mini-Jeff, but to be his own man. And so he probably doesn't like the designation today that he's a, a little Jeff. But... It's, it's easy to do, to parrot someone else, to imitate them. And we need to keep in mind that before Paul and 
his companions came along, um, c- new converts, they didn't know what the Christian life looked like. Keep in mind that Jesus' ministry was in Israel. Who is Paul talking to? to? He's talking to Ephesians, people who were living uh, in Asia Minor or a city in uh, Turkey, present-day Turkey. And so these Ephesians, they didn't even know what Jesus looked like, let alone be able to, to, to follow his example. So, so these new believers, they, they come to Jesus, and no doubt the question mark that comes to their mind is, how do we do this, this Christian thing? How do, we, how do we follow Christ? What does that look like? I, we don't just need to, to hear words. We don't want to hear sermons. We don't want abstracts. We need to know what does it look like uh, to follow Christ. Jesus with our lives. And so Paul says, not just here, but elsewhere, he he recommends his own life as a model that they can follow. In 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 4, verse 16, he gets up in the grill, he gets up in the face of those believers that were living in Corinth, and he says, I exhort you. I mean, he's getting rather feisty here. He says, I exhort you. Be imitators of me. Similarly, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, Be imitators of me, just as I am also of Christ. Now, only here in Ephesians chapter 5, we find this phrase, be imitators, in connection to patterning ourselves after God himself. And I tell you, I don't know about you, but this is an intimidating passage, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're called to... Imitate God is what the text is telling us. What a a lofty goal that is. What a challenge. Who are we uh, to have as as a stated goal? We are here to be exemplary of God. When's the last time you ever told an individual, anybody, I I need to not just be your mentor. I need not just to be your discipler. I'm your model. I'm your role model of how, who you are to follow in terms of, of being like God. I, I think we would think that's rather arrogant on our part to come out and say that. Well, Paul says it. He says, imitate me, not just for me's sake. I don't want you to be little mini Pauls running around. I want you to imitate me only as I imitate Jesus himself. Mimates is the Greek word from which we get the word imitators. Take a wild guess what that word probably um, refers to. Mimics. People who mimic. Yeah. Uh, That's the idea behind the word. It refers to likeness and similarity, not duplicates of something. You see, what happens is when there is a, a person that could be one of your parents, it could be a Christian that you admire, uh, we see someone who we consider to be mature and godly, what happens is we start to impersonate the superficial things of that person. We want to you know, groom our hair just the way they do. We want to wear the same clothes that they do. Uh, we want these shallow, superficial things uh, to be like them. But that's not the idea at all. We need to go deeper underneath the surface and follow the one who that person is following, being the Lord himself. And so the challenge here is we are to be godly or Christ-like, and when we are, that's how we're imitating God. You say, but okay, I understand that. Again, you're being theoretical here, Jeff. What does this look like? How am I supposed to imitate God? Let me put the cookies on the bottom shelf to flesh this out a little bit. When we think about God, there are what are called attributes, characteristics or qualities, traits about God. Um, Qualities that are true of him, that are unique to him. And theologians make reference to two different categories or genres of attributes. There are what are known as incommunicable attributes and communicable attributes. Incommunicable attributes refer to those immeasurable characteristics or qualities of God which cannot be possessed by people or angels or by any entity. For example, God is all-knowing. In other words, he's omniscient. He knows everything about everything. 
He knows what you're thinking right at this moment, what you're feeling, what you're already planning for lunch, or if you were even thinking about lunch. Um, so he's all-knowing. Um, there's no being in the universe who's all-knowing other than God. Uh, God, we also know, is omnipresent. Satan is not omnipresent. Demons are not omnipresent. There is no angel, there's no being in all the universe that is everywhere at all times. God is we also know that it could be said of God that he's omnipotent. In other words, he's all-powerful. He doesn't ever get tired out. He doesn't get weak. Strength uh, never gets depleted from him. So those are incommunicable attributes. You cannot imitate God when it comes to these in incommunicable attributes. It can't happen, no matter how hard you try. You can't be everywhere at all times. You won't ever know everything there is to know. And no matter how much you get into weightlifting, you're not going to become all-powerful. It's just not going to happen. But we can model the communicable attributes of God. What are those? Those are the characteristics or qualities of God, which may also be possessed by people and angels in a limited degree. It's with reference to communicable attributes that we are said to be made in the image of God. For example, the Bible says God is love, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. We can demonstrate love toward one another, can't we? Of course. The Bible tells us that God is holy. Throughout the scripture, we're told, you need to be holy as your heavenly father is holy. As God's holy, you need to be holy. That's something we can do. We can imitate God in that regard. God is a God of, of joy. He's a God of, of peace. These are things that, that we can also imitate as they are true of God. That's one practical way that we can model this. Well, not only can we carry out the dictate to copy God based on our, um, our very ability, but also express through our identity. Did you see the unique distinction of who we're called, what our identity is in this passage? The, the text says that we're beloved children. Back in the day, I don't think uh, pastors do this anymore, but but um, years ago, the, a pastor would come out at a wedding ceremony and say, dearly beloved. And that'd be the first opening words to the marriage ceremony. Guys don't typically do that so much anymore. I mean, that's considered archaic, antiquated, outdated lingo. Um, but it's a, it's a sweet sentiment. And the idea is is the same thing that we find in this text, that we are beloved children, that we're beloved children. This communicates the idea that we are children born of God and that God is our Father. Now, everybody has God as their Father biologically, but not relationally. Only those who are born into the family of God are his spiritual children. And this latter designation is, is what is brought to our attention. We are spiritually born into the family of God. In that sense, we are beloved children. And this refers to the fact that God loves us. And as beloved children, the thing we need to understand is we don't belong to this world anymore. Ever see... Um, um, a jersey with um, typically a, a guy will, will wear um, property of the Cowboys or property of the Rams, you know, and, and they, they boldly wear that shirt as if to say, you know, I'm a stud and I play for that team or I root for that team anyway. Well, it is as though God says to us, you need to, to have that shirt on daily. You're property of God. You don't belong to the world. You might be a citizen here, but your real citizenship, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, is in heaven. You belong now to God. You no longer belong to the world. And because God lovingly made you as his child, you belong to him. And because you belong to God, you need to reflect him. We talk about dysfunctionality in families, don't we? And some of us, as we're sitting here, you're thinking about your relatives, even as we speak. You, you can think of a brother or a sister 
who's kind of out there. And they march to the beat of a different drummer. And you might have a, a son or a daughter who you raised the right way. You pointed that individual to God. And they are running away from God. And you love your son. You love your daughter. You love this individual who bears the same last name. And it hurts you not only that their, their lifestyle is hurtful to them, but really, if the truth were known, you feel hurt deep down inside because that individual is not a good reflection of the family name. There's an embarrassment on your part. Do you ever wonder if God gets, I won't say embarrassed, but kind of shakes his head when he, he watches those who claim to be in his family? We don't want God to be embarrassed. We don't want him shaking his head and thinking, I vey, what a dysfunctional son or daughter I, I have here. Uh, no, we, we want to reflect the Lord in a good way. We don't want people to be pointing their finger of accusation at us and say, you're such a hypocrite. How in the world do you expect me to believe in your God when you don't even live a life that's consistent with your own message? We need to be good reflections. People are watching our lives, not just the Lord, but other people as well. You say, well, how often do I need to do this, this impersonation thing or this imitation thing? Well, you and I need to be imitators of God daily. Every day. There's no coffee breaks. There's no hiatus. There's no respite for believers. Every single day, you and I ought to be imitators of God. There's no caveat here. There's no exception clause. On a regular, routine basis, we need to be imitators of God. And so what does that look like when you're driving along on the 58 highway? You're heading out to Bakersfield. You've got to do a Costco run, right? Or you have a doctor's appointment. So you're driving along, and you get cut off by a truck driver who has the audacity to have on the back of his truck, how am I driving? And you think, oh, if I only had an extra hand, I would write down that number right now. Well, at that time that you get cut off, you need to be an imitator of God. You say, oh, do I have to? Yes. When you are being put on hold for an hour or longer by Amazon or some other customer service department, and then when you finally do get on the line, they have not a clue as to what you're talking about. They don't know how to help you. That's when you need to be an imitator of God. When you can't find a parking place, Oh, and partly because you notice that uh, there's, there's one car that is parked at an angle, diagonally, sucking up two parking spots. You need to be an imitator of God even at that time. When your mate or one of your children just doesn't get it, you need to be an imitator of God. So we've dealt with this dictate be imitators of God. It's an order. It's not an option. Basically, if you don't do this, you're sinning. So am I. But that leads us to the next important point of this passage, and that's the design of copying our creator. The design. There's a, a certain plan. There's a, a strategy that, that God has for us. So we can take out all the, the guesswork. There doesn't have to be any confusion. Uh, this reminds me of a, of a story about a man who, who bought a, a hunting dog. And because the man was, was just really excited, he was eager to see how his new pooch would, would do out there in, in the woods. He, he takes this, this new dog of his, and, and they go out to the woods, and they're going hunting. He's hoping his, his dog will do a great job of being able to, f to find the, the track of, of bears. But what happens is, bam, right smack in the middle of, of hunting, this dog stops, and he goes into a completely different direction. And as it turns out, um, the, the dog actually caught a different scent um, because there was this deer that uh, crossed over the, the, this 
this bear track. And so the dog picked up the, the smell of, of the deer. And so um, the, the hunter is still hoping that this dog is going to work out for him. He's not too sure. This is like a prob probationary time uh, for his, his pooch. And so uh, they continue on. They're hunting along, and, and the dog is <laughs> sniffing along, and, and, and he stops right in the middle of everything, and, and he darts in a completely different direction. And the hunter's all, where did my dog go? And, and, and sure enough, he discovers that his dog had, had, had caught up um, got caught up with the, the scent of a rabbit. And um, the, the hunter's just thinking, what is going on? And so at this point, the hunter is getting exhausted. He is just uh, gasping for air. This is so tiring for him. And this just goes on and on. After a while, he's out of breath. Eventually, the hunter catches up to the dog. And the dog uh, is barking at the hole uh, where there had been some mice. Uh, this dog gets distracted. We're like that dog. There's a little bit of that pooch in all of us, right? I mean, we start off with just the best resolve in the world that we're going to follow the Lord. We're, we're just going to, like blinders, be focused on him. We're not going to get distracted. And before long, we're straying off the trail. We, we pick up a different scent. Our sniffer has us going in a completely different direction. We could be just like that mutt. We've got the resolve, but our attention gets diverted to things of lesser importance. One pursuit that we have leads to another until we've completely strayed away from the original plan. Happens to all of us. You start out well. You have your, your morning devotional. Um, you and, and the Lord are, are tight. You are focused on walking with him today. And like out of the blue, you get distracted with your sniffer, looking in a completely different direction. You get distracted. Now, if we are to not stray away like that, God, like, like that dog, we need to understand God's plan, his design for us. And let me make it simple. According to this passage, we need to be focused on copying the love of God. I mean, there's a lot of different things that we can copy about the Lord, right? But here he says, as you want to focus on copying the Lord, God, you want to imitate him, Make it about love. Make it about the love of God. I, I get this from our text, which says, walk in love. You know, we, we live, I don't need to tell you this, you know this. We live in such a violent, hateful day and age. Who ever would think that, that people would come along and, and they would be taking bricks and ice cold water bottles and, and throwing them uh, through businesses, paint glass windows, just walking right in, looting. Who would think that, that people would go around wearing shirts that wear blue lives murder? Whoever thought we would live in a day and age where, where rioting is in and it's applauded? What kind of a day and age that we live in? This, this is a violent time. I don't need to tell you. There are cities that are battling with rioting and their own government workers are just sitting there doing nothing. Whether we're talking mayors or governors, they're just letting it go on. People's lives are being ruined financially physically. We live in chaotic, dangerous days filled with venom and, and this toxic hatred. It's, it's all around us. But we need to be different than that. We need to be a sharp contrast to all the hate that we see, which is a part of our day and age. And so he tells us we need to conduct our lives with the quality of love. The word for love there in verse 21 is agapeta, 
And it speaks of showing understanding and purpose. You are being understanding when you're being empathetic. When you put a zipper over it and you start communicating with your ears before your mouth. You hear what others have to say. You understand them. You, you perceive what their hurts are, their, their pains. You're empathetic toward them. Not only is this love um, mentioned in the love chapter, which is what? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Very good. This also, this quality of love is a fruit of the Spirit. Interesting. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 makes that abundantly clear. And because it's a fruit of the Spirit, guess what? You can't manufacture this on your own. The Spirit of God has to give you this divine, supernatural love for another person. This is not natural. That's why, again, Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Those in the church, you can't love this way apart from the Spirit of God producing that love. You can't love your mate with this kind of agape love, unconditional, understanding, purposeful love apart from the Spirit of God working in you. This is not of this world, this love that is referred to in this passage. And so we are to order our behavior in such a way that we demonstrate this supernatural love which is imparted in us and through us through the Holy Spirit. This is a supernatural love. Now the way we are designed to copy the love of God is by copying the Lamb of God. We are to ultimately model our, our, our lives based on the pattern of Jesus himself. Verse 2 says that we're to love just as Christ also loved you. How do we do that? You say that, that seems kind of challenging because, I mean, we're talking Jesus here. Um, well, the text itself gives us the answer. Sometimes we ask questions and we run to commentaries or we, we run to other books to get explanation. Hey, look, the best commentary of the Bible is the Bible itself. And so we find in the context the answer in terms of how Jesus loves, which is the way we are supposed to love. It says right over here um, in verse 2 that we are to love just as Jesus loved you and he gave himself up. Now, Jesus did not give up on himself, but he gave himself up. What does that mean? Well, in addition to verse 2, throughout the New Testament, Jesus giving himself up is linked to his love. Those two go hand in hand together. Uh, later on, eventually, we will get to chapter 5, verse 25, where it's talking to men specifically husbands. And there we are told um, uh, Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is reinforced by Paul, by the way, in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. I love this verse. There Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. There we see the love of, of God directly connected with God giving himself up or delivering himself up for us. And our passage here tells us more detail. I don't mean to be pedantic or overly analytical or scholastic here, but there's a lot of meat in this one passage. I, we've got to see this together. I'd like you to notice here that the text tells us that Jesus gave himself up for us. The word us cannot refer exclusively to the Ephesians. If this only referred to the Ephesians, then guess what? Everyone who's not an Ephesian is in trouble. But this applies to all believers. This is not just talking to the people who received this original letter. Also, if the word us only refers to the elect, then we are, are still too narrow in our understanding. The word us there 
is not talking to just elected believers, those who were chosen before the foundation of the world. One important principle of interpretation is scripture interprets scripture. God's word sheds light on God's word. When we understand what God says elsewhere, we can see through cross-references the meaning of a passage. And so in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it sheds light on who the us happen to be um, in our, our text. Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that for a moment. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. According to that verse, who are the sinners? Those who are identified as us. Sinners and us, in Romans 5, 6, are talking about one and the same person. And since all people are sinners, Jesus died for everyone. The text says Christ died for us. And those of us who are part of us are sinners. Hence, ergo... All of us have benefited by Jesus dying for us. Now in Ephesians 5.2, it goes on to tell us how Jesus gave himself up for us. It says Christ gave himself up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God. And just as um, God giving himself up and loving are linked, So it is that this idea of sacrifice and offering go hand in hand. They also are linked together. And we see this beautifully illustrated in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 10. It says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered... One sacrifice for sins for all time sat down at the right hand of God. So there, the sacrifice and the offering go together. In Christ, get this, the offering and the offerer are one and the same. Jesus both made an offering and he himself was the offering. He offered himself to the Father as our representative. Let's dig a little deeper. Look at that word sacrifice. Uh, The Greek says thusian. It refers uh, to a a slain victim that is is going up in smoke. And the picture is that of animals or a flock of animals that are sacrificed on an altar. They're killed in a holy place. And portions of that animal are, are burned up on that altar. Well, Jesus' lifelong obedience and his perfect fulfillment of the law made him a perfect sacrifice. It's true, Jesus is God in the flesh. But during his time on the planet, his righteousness that is imputed or ascribed to us comes as a result of him Perfectly obeying the Lord, the word of God, and fulfilling the law of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. His sacrifice was so acceptable that it smelled good. It had a fragrant aroma scent to it. While we're outdoors here, I don't dare put on any kind of cologne. I mean, uh, there have been weeks that we have been out here and, and I'm attracting the flies. I mean, let's admit it. I, I don't know if it's because there's perspiration that I'm emitting or the, they just think I'm delicious, whatever. I, I get flies that, that come toward me. Today's a good day. We don't see so many flies uh, that are attacking us. But uh, there is some kind of a scent that we all have that we give off at different times. Poor Zanita. There are times where she does not want to be around me. Um, She can't stand when I have slugged down half a dozen eggs. She doesn't like my egg breath, doesn't like the scent that comes from that. She can't stand it when I'm I'm eating tuna. 
and she gets the, the tuna smell that comes from me. Or I've got this Vitamix, this pitcher at my home, and I'll throw broccoli in there, and it's, it's this disgustingly nasty but very, very healthy protein drink. And as healthy as it is for me, the scent is not a fragrant aroma by any stretch of the imagination. When you think of a fragrant aroma, what comes to your mind? Ladies, do you have a, a certain perfume that you use? Guys, do you have certain cologne that you use? I, I, I did a little study and I discovered that one of the most popular women's perfume is called Chanel's Coco Mademoiselle, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Eau de Parfum. Does that sound right? Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. As long as I can read the label, I can buy one for Zanita, I suppose. Uh, and then for guys, there's something called Raw Chemistry uh, Pheromones Men's Cologne. It sounds really expensive, but maybe it smells good. So we think of cologne, we think of perfume having this good, fragrant aroma. It smells good to our, our noses. But maybe you don't realize this. Originally, uh, a fragrant aroma was, was a heathen experience. And unbelievers, uh, what they would do is they would have this burnt sacrifice that they would be about. They supposedly allowed this, this animal to be burned up and its scent, they thought, was ascending up to the nostrils of their gods. And if your sacrifice was acceptable... Then the gods smiled upon you and it was all good. If your sacrifice was poor, uh, then the god frowned upon you and, and you were not acceptable. Those gods supposedly participated in worship through what's called an oblation or, or sacred feast. Now, can you recall, just from reading the scriptures on your own, sacrifices in the Hebrew scriptures? Actually, in the book of Genesis, we come across one of those sacrifices uh, tied in on the heels of uh, the flood with Noah and his family. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. There was incense and burnt sacrifices that were burned that emitted an odor to heaven. God's acceptance or his rejection of a person was dependent on whether or not that person was spiritually acceptable. That's why Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable. He was not acceptable. Noah's sacrifice was acceptable because he was walking with God. And then the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he draws attention. He puts the spotlight on aroma. Well, there are different ways that we can be a fragrant aroma before the Lord. The text tells us here, uh, Christians bring a fragrant aroma to God. Those who have knowledge of Jesus, this is an appealing scent, according to 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. When Dave Gilliam was leading our offering this morning, um, I, I wasn't looking. I imagine that um, some or maybe many of you were, were giving an offering. And that, according to the scriptures, is a fragrant aroma to God. It's, it's a good scent. It doesn't stink to him. It smells good to him, according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. But in this passage, Paul is saying death was a fragrant aroma to God. The unique death of his own son, that smelled good to God. It pleased God's nostrils to the extent that we're reconciled to him. Now let's tie all this together. Let's, let's um, wrap up our thoughts together because if we don't get this overarching idea, we're going to get lost in the details here. And so the point of this passage is that we need to copy our creator by mimicking our master who sacrificially loved us. We're to model love before others. Just as Jesus sacrificially loved us by laying down his life for us, we need to sacrificially love those around us. And what does sacrifice mean? It means that you have to give up something. It may be your time. It may be money. It may be something else. 
an easy way that you can sacrifice is when you get a prayer request that comes to you, you can stop right in the middle of what you're doing. Yeah, you, we're right in the middle of something. You can stop right then and there and pray on behalf of that individual. I love 1 John 3, 16. It says, we know love by this. This is what it looks like. That he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, let me just say in closing, you still may be troubled in thinking, well, how do I show this, this modeling, this imitating? I, I need just a little bit more. All right, let me give you three quick, fast tips that you can immediately put into practice. You say, Jeff, I'm convinced. According to this passage, I need to imitate God. He tells me to do it, but I still need a little help. So how? Pray tell. Let me give you three quick tips. Number one, commit yourself to mimicking the master. Make that a commitment. Tell yourself today, from this day forward, maybe I haven't taken this seriously in the past, but from today on, I'm going to commit myself, I'm going to resolve to mimic the master. Listen, impersonators, the Frank Caliendos, the Rich Littles, Frank Gorshins, people who excel in impersonating they will spend hours, hundreds, maybe thousands of hours analyzing and studying, dissecting the personality traits of the person they're trying to be just like. How much more important is it for us to commit ourselves to putting in the time to model the Lord in our lives? Number two, ask God for assistance. You can't model God by yourself. You don't have the ability, nor do I. So a great place to start is saying, you know what, I need to do this. I make this commitment and I'm going to ask God for his help. I'm going to ask God to help me with this. I love in Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5, the psalmist says, make me know thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. That's a teachable spirit. Show me what it looks like, Lord. I'm asking for your help. And finally, number three, emulate God's mature kids. Emulate God's mature kids. Now, you know as well as I do that being an older person doesn't automatically mean that you're more mature. There are senior adults, there are elderly people who are spiritually immature. It's not about age. There are some pretty mature spiritually individuals who are considered young or younger. On the other hand, a good natural progression of the Christian faith is that the longer we walk with the Lord, there ought to be more wisdom that goes along with that. And so we need to emulate older people who are following the Lord. Titus chapter 2 tells us older women need to be investing in younger women. Older men need to be teaching mentoring, discipling the younger men. So that's important. Um, and if you don't have a discipler, if you don't have someone that you're emulating, that's something you can do. You, you can look for others who will model Jesus. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Well, as we, we bring this to a conclusion, it, it could very well be that you're trying to follow Jesus' code of ethics, but there's something missing. There's something that's, that's not there. Well, you can't follow God, you can't model God if you don't know him. It all begins with a personal relationship with the Lord himself. It's impossible to follow Jesus without knowing Jesus and to know Jesus comes down to exercising faith in his person and work, believing that he died for you, he was raised from the dead for you, and you do what the Bible calls repent. It's not a popular word. But you've been going in one direction, you need to do an about face and go in a different direction where you are willing to turn away from anything that you know is displeasing to God and you follow him. And so we point you to Christ today. If you have never come to Jesus, we're not talking religion, we're talking relationship. The invitation is open. He invites you to come to him 
and you exercise your faith, your trust in his person and his work. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we know that this is more than just a daunting task, more than just a heroic ambition. Um, this is an impossible challenge for us to be imitators of you in and of ourselves. We so desperately need your touch upon our lives to be the kind of role models that you have called us to be. Other people are watching our lives, uh, believers and unbelievers. And so it behooves us to be excellent examples and models for them, but we also need it for ourselves. So help us, Lord, to snuggle up to you, to walk with you, to get to know you better, so that you may live your life in us and through us. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. We give you praise and thanksgiving and dedicate the rest of this weekend into your care. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening, for joining us today. You have a blessed rest of the day.